How's everybody? Um, coffee talk today is going to be fun. We have a lot to cover here, so I'm trying to I'm trying to uh, just figure out what we should cover first. I think I think the most important thing we should cover is what uh, what we've been talking about with certification and Linux and the focus on cybersecurity. So. Um, I have the schedule up here, you can see, and, um, so I just, I, there's been a lot of conversation this morning during the live coding about where this stream is going to go and how much of it, and, and, and frankly, how much I'm going to do with Skillstack, which is my, my company that I do for mentoring. And, um, we've been talking about LPIC, we've been talking about DEF CON, we've been talking about cybersecurity and the need and the, that the fact that it's the fastest growing career out there <clears throat> and so if you when you add all those things together you start to get a situation where you know uh, stuff is going on um, just give me a second here Sorry for that, guys. Uh, it's, an, it's an ongoing struggle figuring out when to stream uh, from this location. I'll be moving, so I'll be able to be more reliable later. But right now, I'm right in the middle of family life, so it's kind of hard to get a quiet time. No, despite all my planning and scheduling, it just doesn't work. <laughs> it's sometimes frustrating. So anyway, let's go back to the stream. So we're going to be focusing on cybersecurity above all else uh, and and the, the foundational skills to get to uh, cybersecurity specifically pen testing so uh, I've been I've been wanting to focus on that for a very long time and I really believe that that's where the greatest need is so we're just gonna do that we're gonna make that the, the top priority that means however though focusing on all the skills necessary to get up to that point and I have covered some of that in this P2P document, which kind of shows what I feel like is sort of a lay of the land technologist. And then you layer on top of this, uh, this stuff from the Mastering Technology fund Fundamentals, which is skillstack.io slash mtf slash mtf.pdf. There is no document other than this for now. Um, so this is the core services, command line, knowledge source, uh, Jamstack web development, which is necessary for bug bounty, learning, the pa learning how to use Bash and Linux, uh, and then learning how to administer multiple systems. This might actually change. So right here I have it under system administration and I have Linux, Mac, Windows, and Raspberry Pi that you, to be a system administrator, you need to be able to administer all of those machines, all of those desktops. And um, so the question is, I mean, I had a career for several years as a Linux administrator and I knew Windows, but not to the level as a system administrator and I didn't really need to. I could have a career as, as a Linux professional. So. Um, the way things are shaping up is that if you want to do cybersecurity blue team, which is defense, it's basically you're just a really good system administrator or the popular term now is a site reliability engineer, which means you know how to code in addition to everything else. So if that is where we're going with this, uh, as a sysadmin, you know, you can focus on just Linux and be a really good blue team Linux person. Um, if you're going to do a more broad range, you know, system administration, you have to have more skills uh, in order to take care of different operating systems. You also need to have 
uh, core level Windows knowledge if you're going to be a pen tester and you're going to break into stuff. So, um, so if I were to just do nothing more than to share and teach all of the stuff up to this point, not to mention networking and the stuff that we're going to get to, that would be, you know, two, three years of material for most people. Um, but those of you who want to get to stuff fast, uh, the certificates are a pretty fast way. And a lot of the people on the stream have this knowledge, a lot of this knowledge already. So it's just a matter of, of plugging the gaps and then getting the certificates so you can get, uh, you can get the, the jobs. Um, so there's a lot of organic, um, you know, decision making going on in, in my decisions about what I teach here. And particularly now that I'm going on stream more. So, but, uh, I think that's all I'll say about that. Why do you care? Well, you care because you want to find the fastest path to a tech career. Uh, you care because you want to find out what the fastest path specifically to a pen testing career is the hacking, you know, red team. Uh, you may want to know what the fastest path is to become a web developer, you know, a full stack web developer. Uh, and what I'm saying is that I am not going to be covering full stack web development. That is, so why do you care if, 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 so if you're coming here to learn full stack web development and to learn react and view and, and Svelte and all that jazz, uh, that's not going to be what we're going to learn unless you want to learn about how to break into it, <laughs> which really has nothing to do with the front end. That's more of a, you know, that's, that's more of a, you know, SQL injection and, and cross site scripting and all that. So, so in, 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 in lieu, in lieu or you of progressive web applications development, we will be learning, uh, how to, how to break in. So that means that we'll be learning about JavaScript node. I mean, JavaScript DOM not particularly node other than to attack it. And uh, we'll be learning more PHP uh, because those are all very vulnerable technologies. We're not necessarily learning them to create code for them. We're learning them with the goal of attacking them. And uh, so the, the stream's gonna take on a much a much deeper pen testing focus. Um, I'm kind of excited because because I have been focused mostly on blue team my whole career. I've been, you know, system compliance auditing and all of that stuff. And, and I, I, you know, I got to understand a lot of systems, primarily Linux and AIX and Solaris and all the other Unix flavors. But, um, I've never, other than my hobby, my hobbies, you know, in attacking or, or finding bugs, which I've done, uh, it hasn't ever been a professional, you know, a professional focus of mine. So, uh, so I kind of like that because that means that on the stream, I'm actually doing something that I want to do. <laughs> You know, I also want to play Witcher, right? So I'm going to play Witcher on the stream. And then there's more going to be more chance of me actually participating on the stream, doing fun things. Um, uh, looks like it ended in October. The LPI comp TIA, you found it out. Okay. So we've been doing a little bit of research that Zero has, has concluded here that the relationship between Linux plus and LPI C uh, one at released, uh, looks like that relationship ended in October up to that point. I believe um, you can correct me zeros if I got this wrong, but that um, the Linux Plus um, certification was uh, Linux Plus was was administered, if I got this right, by the Linux Professional uh, Institute (LPI). And I get LPI all the time. Let me show you these. I get LPI mixed up constantly with the Linux Foundation. It's just me because it's. So the Linux Professional Institute, Institute, oh, Institute. So we have LPI, Linux Professional Institute, which I do believe is a for-profit corporation. Yep, in Toronto. You know what I gotta tell you, man? If you want to get into tech and you're in Canada, Toronto and Ontario are like exploding. So all the software, a lot of the software departments for Amer large American companies are right over the border. And I, my theory is, is that they can get really great people without having to go through American immigrations. I, I, I know that sounds, I don't mean it to sound racist. I just, when I was, when I was up there at the software group, when I visited for IBM and I was driving through there and there was stuff in Chinese and then there was stuff in French and everything. And there's like, there were like, there's like these huge buildings. I believe it was uh, Toronto more. And there's all software. It's all software. It's like this tiny little Silicon Valley right across the border. And 
honestly, I don't understand the reason, but there is a lot of software development in Canada. I mean, it is a lot. So, um, so you might want to think about that. Okay, so LPI is a nonprofit. Okay, well, I feel better about that because that's what I've been telling people because I thought that was true. Um, so that means. Hmm. So LPI, Linux Professional Institute, is a nonprofit organization founded in Canada on October 25th, 1999, and orients towards certifications for Linux, BSD, and open source software. You know what? The fact that it's a nonprofit already makes me like it more than Pearson. So, and I'm just going to spill, I'm going to give you the list of things. So Pearson was behind this, this right to repair lawsuits and these, these lobbying that they're doing to try to stop people for that. Um, Pearson has largely been a multiple choice test. They have, it's been reported that they have really, really, really old software in their testing centers. They are not state of the art, but for some reason, Pearson has got their hands into everything. And if you want to work for the government, you have to get an A plus cert. You have to get like a Linux plus cert. And this shows up in the WGU materials, the Western, the uh, Western Governors University stuff, which I've talked about before on stream about how you can hack the system and get your WGU uh, bachelor's of cybersecurity and, you know, a year if you really put your head down right and you can pay less than you know 10 12 grand for the whole thing so and and, and it's completely accredited and everything so look into that if you haven't done that wgu is where you might want to consider it. however if you look at the list of certificates from wgu which i don't want to pull up right now but if you look at their list of certificates they're almost all pearson certificates they're very you know and they're cheaper certificates but none they don't include any of the offensive security certificates which we were drooling over today so Offensive Security is this company that's been around since I think probably 2005. They were behind Cali Linux. And they are, if you're a pen tester, this is the certificate to have. I mean, <laughs> they are like, I, I even just looking at them now, I'd like, I want to collect them all. I want, I must collect all of the certificates. All the certs shall be mine. Um, and I, here's another selfish thing. Uh, even though I'm an old guy and I probably will never get a job doing any of this stuff. I actually am seriously thinking about actively pursuing all of the offensive security certificates on stream and taking, you know, I've got quite a bit of Linux knowledge. I think, I mean, I read a thing the other day that said some of the, hey, hi, hi, Akigo. Uh, so these are these, these certificates are so awesome. They are like really fun. We're doing just a little stream for our coffee talk. Welcome to the stream. Uh, we're going to be talking about all kinds of things about technology. Right now, we're talking about cybersecurity. So, and this will be on YouTube. So, if you don't, if you want to review it later, this will go up right up to YouTube for coffee talk today. Great, great to have you. So, um, we've got uh, we've got the Cali Linux stuff. We've got web exploitation, which, by the way, is fourteen hundred dollars. Where's the where's the prices again? Let's show you these. And I have nothing to do with these people. And we've decided, there's another thing we decided this morning when we were just chatting, is that that I am never going to take money from an organization or a product of any kind. If I take money from anybody, it'll be you. <laughs> so if I, if I, and by the way, I would really appreciate, you know, subbing and, you know, the PayPal eventually when the, as the content gets better, because that's how I'm going to fund the content for this stream and if i can do that and i can represent you as somebody who's going through the process and doing you know the as a community doing this research together then that's my goal that's that's what i want for you i want you to be able to succeed as a, as a technology professional and specifically as a pen testing cybersecurity professional um but that means you got to build a foundation and i have that foundation I've, I've developed that over the course of my career so now i would just like to layer on top of that foundation um, these really, really awesome cybersecurity skills. I mean, they're so fun, you know? Pen testing is fun. Not only is it fun, it's profitable, man. It's the fat, cybersecurity is the fastest growing tech path right now, according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics from the United States government. So not only do we need it, but it's a really great thing. So um, they have a cert that we we're gonna pursue. But before I can get into pursuing all of these certifications, um, what about Security Plus? I'm considering a certificate, but only for the name and not for the knowledge. Yeah. So the Security Plus uh, is a Pearson test. It's required by everybody. Um, it is, it, it, I'm sorry, it's required by the Department of Defense and everything. You can't even get in the door at the DOD. You have to have A plus, And I'm pretty sure these days, if you want to work at the Pentagon and places like that, you have to have Security Plus. At one point I had that webpage up, what it said, all the certs you have to have, uh, 
but before you can get in, <laughs> you're trolling him there. Zeros. I'm sure he, he has the knowledge probably. So, but unfortunately, and this is the thing, this is the thing. Okay. So let me tell a little story here. So offensive security comes out with a certificate for o OSCP and they say in there that you need to know about Linux before you can do it. And then they have trouble because nobody knows Linux. <laughs> so, so they had to create a certificate called, uh, Cali called, um, Cali, Cali, what is it? Cali released. Here it is. They created a free utility for you to learn about Linux and they have you learn specifically about their version of Linux, which is Kali Linux. So if you've got essential certification like Zeros just got the other day, congrats, dude. And then, you know, you, you might have all this knowledge already, but there's no, I actually think getting the Kali version of Linux essentials, which is called Kali Linux cert, uh, or was it certified, was it Kali Linux certified professional? That's it. So K, LCP. If you get your KLCP, I think it has more weight than the Linux Essentials because Kali and Offensive Security, which has, I believe, in the industry has a much better reputation than Pearson, even though with, with people who know, by the way, not with pencil pushers who are hiring people who don't know. You know, these they are they are largely, oh, you gotta get the A plus. All the Pearson certificates are the best. They don't actually evaluate them by any means. They don't a lot of these people who make these decisions don't know that most of the Pearson tests, as far as I know today, are all multiple choice and there is no interactive lab. Whereas all of the offensive security certificates, except for the CLCP, are you have to log in, you have a certain amount of time and you have to actually perform within a given amount of time. These are not multiple choice. The only multiple choice test from offensive security that I know of is this one, the Kali Linux one. And they actually, it's, it's actually uh, implemented by Pearson, which I believe personally, I don't know, but I believe that that's why they don't have it on the main page. <laughs> because the main page with all their other sexy certificates is uh, these are all lab based and, and they come with a course built in. You take the course and I'm actually, can you tell that I'm excited I wanted to sign up for one of these? <laughs> <So> <laughs> can you tell? I'm like, and if I'm not going to be streaming about something I love to do, right? people stream about their favorite game, right? So Smash Bros, <laughs> Overwatch, whatever the fuck. And so I actually want to, I want to, I want to stream about me getting the certificate because I think it would just be so much fun. This, I know it's expensive. You know why? Because it's good. <laughs> it, they charge more money for this certificate because this certificate is actually testing your real skills. All of the other multiple choice tests, you have a 25% chance uh, of getting it right without knowing anything. <laughs> more than a thousand. This one is 800. You know, let's look at the prices. And you know what? That, this is going to be for everybody, obviously. Um, and do you need it? I don't know. You know, I'm trying to find the prices. Where are the prices? It didn't have prices before. We lost the prices. Where did they go? Register. No, nope, that's not it. Um, hmm. They had the prices. Oh, there we go. Overview and pricing. So here they are. They are not cheap. Um, as are most things worth a value in life. Um, you have to pay. So do you know what you're paying for though, right? Here you're paying, it's expensive, but you're paying, this is not a boot camp, okay? This is this is not a boot camp where you pay eight grand and don't learn how to pay anything, right? Um, no, your question's fine. So, but these, okay, so these certificates, the reason they're so expensive is because they run a full VPN that you have to connect to and they include the, the, the price of the entire course. So you take the test and you get all of the course that goes with it. And again, I have nothing to do with them. I am just, I am just somebody who wants to take them. I have not take gotten these certs because they are so expensive and they're hard to get. Uh, okay. Well, at least, at least, at least you get the course. I like that. They will teach you exactly what's on the test and then you take the test and actually you can pay to extend the time frame to take the test again. So if you don't pass the test. But the problem, this is entirely hands-on. The entire thing is hands-on. And I cannot tell you how how much that means to me personally, because I, I'm very much a hands-on guy. And it's not just me. This is, this is what other cybersecurity pen testing engineers value. They value the fact 
they, they, they might poke fun at people with Kali Linux and script kitties and stuff, but at the end of the day, they value this kind of certification way more over a Linux Plus. Oh, Linux Plus, you're going to go work for the DoD? You know? To people, uh, we have an interesting question here. Let me, it's, it's a little bit of a divergence. Let me just read it, though. Uh, are you able to determine if data is being sent to people's clients in an Android application in real time? Well, it depends. Did you see the thing? This actually, this is in, I'm glad you asked that, Cecile. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. We're going to cover that. I'm going to go through the news of the day and they just closed. Uh, uh, they're closing a bug in Chrome and, um, well, it's not a bug. They're closing down DNS, D DNS and they're making it all encrypted now. All right, so let's wrap, let's wrap up the certification topic. Let's wrap up where this, you know, stream is going, that kind of topic. Uh, if you can PM me, I will send you a link. I cannot open a PM on a new account. Um, a PM, oh, sure, I'll wait. Uh, okay, so we are going to talk about that. Um, let's see. Now, is the course at Jerome Page or do you follow it like a real class? Week one, week zero. Uh, this is, I think it's at your own pace, actually. I think I cannot remember. I really don't know. So let's figure that out because I really think that the, the focus of this stream is going to be Mr. Rob gets his OSCP <laughs> in addition to all the other stuff, right? So, so, and let me just, let me just summarize that. So what's happening on the stream? On the one hand, it's going to be all of the information you need to know to get started in tech. And then all the rest is going to be all the information about getting specifically certified in pen testing the best way possible talking to professionals about what that means and and then you know proceeding that way and and i will i will drive this as if as i am doing it because i have background knowledge so i can give you all context on stuff while i'm getting mine and then and then we'll go that way um and at this point i believe that means i'm going to rule out a master's from wgu I've been seriously considering a master's from WGU versus in cybersecurity uh, versus getting the offensive security certificates and the other option of doing both, which is quite spendy. I mean, that's on the order of 10 grand to do that. So honestly, I think, I think for what offensive security certificates give you and the fact that cybersecurity does not need as much uh, profile stuff, they, they depend more heavily on certification, certification to get a job. I just, I just think that this is one of the fastest paths to security. Now, I need, I want to confirm that decision with a bunch of people in the industry, in addition to what I've already, you know, gathered. So, uh, oh yeah, that's an interesting question. We'll have to look at that. I don't know about that particular one. Uh, uh, so Cecile is, is asking about some stuff about whether a site can be hacked, um, and uh, we'll have to come back to that after after our, our wrap up. So, um, so again, how we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about how to get a base in technology to even get a foothold in the, in it, which by the way, if you don't know what to do, go out right now and get the free book from linuxcommand.org and start learning the Linux command line. First things first, install Linux, get really familiar with Linux, uh, offensive security wouldn't have a Kali Linux. Don't install Kali Linux. Install, you know, I would I would suggest starting with Mint. And but I mean I don't know. I might have to reevaluate that. Maybe we'll start starting with Kali because if you have Kali by default as your first Linux operating system, you'll be really well suited to go into the cybersecurity field. I've been having people put Mint on things because it's the easiest Linux to learn uh, by far and. Uh, I've been dissuading people to use Arch because it's not used out in the industry. Uh, so, you know, my I think I think I might actually change my base install to be Kali and shift everything that I do to be cybersecurity based. So even if somebody's setting up a Minecraft server, they're learning about Kali Linux in the process other than when they're starting up a server. Kali, Kali Linux for live mode, yeah, for sure. That's a good that's a good idea. Not Fedora, no, no. And so Fedora, Fedora and CentOS and Red Hat and all that stuff, those are all required if you want to get certified. So this is another thing. If we're taking on pen testing, we don't have to have broad knowledge of all of the operating systems from Linux. So, and this, this is another thing that is very misunderstood. If you don't, let's see, I'd love to see you get these certs on stream. I know, wouldn't it be fun, AJ? <laughs> you know what? 
the thing that I probably would get in big trouble, but because these are all VPN, these are all VPN things. So I could actually do the test on stream. <laughs> I can actually do the courses on stream. I absolutely know I would get busted for that. They would be like, <laughs> they would come on, on down on me like a ton of bricks. They'd be like, hell no, right? So especially if they're not sponsoring me or anything, which I'm not going to do. I, I talked, I thought about maybe having them sponsor me for a bit, you know, go through it say, hey, Mr. Rob, you know, kind of fails his way through, <laughs> through the certs, you know, join him for today's fail, you know, because learning is how you learn through failure, right? So, so <laughs> I, I'm always talking down to you guys down here. I got to put you up here. So it looks like I'm talking to you. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put, I'm going to do something. I'm going to apply, I'm going to try something. I'm going to put it right here. So then it looks like I'm looking at you. So I'm cool. Uh, you got your Red Hat version? Yeah, I mean, Red Hat, did you, got, did you get your Red Hat cert? A lot of people like Red Hat. I ran Red Hat for nine years. I was original Red Hat stockholder too. I stole that at the wrong time, my God. Red Hat, Red Hat's a different story. What Linux version should we learn? So here's, here's my take on that. And we, how much time we have? Cause I don't, I wanna run out of time here. So yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm old. I, I was, you know, we were running Slackware. Red Hat was the new kid on the block. They were super cool. They were the arch of the day. Yeah. Uh, Z. Because Red Hat was a bit expensive. Yeah. Well, of course you're not going to buy Red Hat now. Red Hat's a silly. Okay. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's kind of a great segue, segue into our, into our, uh, our, our mail uh, and our, our news of the day because um, there's actually news about CentOS and Red Hat in the news uh, and Rancher OS. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna, the way I've decided to go through news now is to just read, I would have been making a good point of, so I got a few new people on the stream, so just this is how I do my news. I, I go through all the email from multiple Google alerts and other things, and I curate all of that. And then I find the stuff in there as well as reading multiple, multiple tw tweets and stuff from Reddit and uh, stuff on the chat. And if I find anything particularly newsworthy, I'll, I post that to Twitter. So that's pretty much like what everybody else does. Um, and, but it's relatively new. I haven't been doing that up until this time. So the way we're going to go through Coffee Talk is going to be, I'm going to go through my past tweets and explain what I mean by them and tell you some of the backstory behind it so that I can give you more information about it. And then if you, if you want to go see what I posted. So we had a problem because the last few coffee talks, I've been, co I've been posting things, you know, with, uh, with URLs and stuff and people haven't been able to read the URLs because, you know, they're, they can't click on them and stuff. So we're just going to use Twitter for that. And it just, it doesn't mean I'm, you're going to get kind of a flurry of tweets for me, uh, every once in a while. Um, but it's nice because we've had other people on my Twitter stream, pick it up. Um, my Twitter following isn't nearly as good as it was back in the virtual world days. I was up in the thousands, but these days it doesn't matter to me as long as um, I can get information out. So just really quickly going through the notifications. Um, oh yeah, okay. So that, we've, I found uh, there's a free book on full stack. Mm. Uh, Okay, yeah, man, wait, this, is a, this is a lot of this is a lot of really good stuff here. So uh, let's start with the first one. So I'll go to what I've posted recently. So if you want to follow along with me, just go to twitter.com/rwxrob, and uh, I mean I can give you that quote, quote that that thing, but it's not too hard to get to. And um, you can just uh, I appreciate a follow if you want, but I'm going to go ahead and go through these. I do have my schedule up here in case you want to know. Um, and as that, that's pinned, I've changed that from the books pin. Uh, so, and these are in reverse chronological order from when, from when I, I found them. So we're just going to do that. So ORMs, ORMs are definitely being replaced by GraphQL. So this is actually from Viable showed me this today. So there's a site called Prisma.io, uh, which I had not heard of until this morning, actually. And, um, this is a way to make a GraphQL API. So if you haven't been following along, a lot of my live streaming, live coding has been GraphQL. So I'm doing a lot of GraphQL because I'm going through the process of migrating a ton of repos from GitHub, GitHub over to GitLab, some of which were already there. And I'm writing tools in Bash 
to do that, to set private, to set public, to do the migration, to delete. And so I am using all of that as a GraphQL. And so GraphQL has been a, a big topic of, for me lately. And it's, a, it's, it's actually a really good topic to get into because you know, there's so many things you can do with GraphQL and particularly making your own. In fact, I believe so strongly in GraphQL that, that I don't think it's worth your time to learn REST at all. Uh, if you're, if you're going to learn REST, you're going to, you're going to have to learn it on a gig and they're going to say, do you have any experience? You can say, yes, well, I'm mostly GraphQL, but I understand REST enough to port my stuff to GraphQL. Cause I, I can't think of a single company that I've read about who is creating a REST API now. Every single company is creating GraphQL APIs. So that is the standard. They're like their third year on having a huge GraphQL convention. If you're not learning GraphQL, you cannot do backend full stack, you know, sort of web programming period. It is the standard. And I went down a rabbit hole yesterday with the licensing that came from Facebook originally. And I talked about that on the coffee talk yesterday. And I've concluded that it's totally safe. Um, that it's no, it's not going to be interfered with by Facebook's, you know, crazy licensing schemes and, and all of that. So I think we're good there. Uh, what else we got? So we've got, uh, so Prism, so Prisma, Prisma is an, a GraphQL thing that somebody mentioned to me. Uh, it has a library in Go. Uh, I'm going to just make a, put a plug for Go in here. Uh, you know, there's no Python here, right? <laughs> there's not even any Rust here. So this is another, yet another application that supports JavaScript, TypeScript, and Go. So you need to learn Go. Uh, you know, violent Go. Go is moving into the cybersecurity space very strongly. In fact, it's not covered a lot because it's new in that niche area, but it has so much potential. I would suggest a lot of these cybersecurity tools and auditing tools could be rewritten in Go and people, there's 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 millionaires out there to be made who, who, who are going to write cybersecurity software in Go because of how easy it is to use every single core on your computer easily. That means you can write and maintain code easier than any other language. And I believe far easier than Node and far easier than Rust, but that's not Rust's sweet spot. And it's also not Node's sweet spot. This is the sweet spot for a Go application. So if you're not learning Go, you should be learning it. You should be learning that and Rust. And um, if you, I mean, of course the web stuff too. So back, um, and that, that Prism is just a really cool uh, framework for, for doing GraphQL kind of thing. So I'll bring that to our attention. Um, uh, I'm told. Oh, here's another. Here's another reason you need to learn Rust. So, coffee talk yesterday. I bet I was. I was noticing how much is is surfacing in Rust. And so, what we're seeing in Rust is what we saw probably 2009 with Go. Two, 9, 10, 11. I mean, that was that was when it came out, kind of. So, so Go came out. It was a new language. Every it hadn't really hit mainstream. Everybody started experimenting with it. And in probably 2013, 2014 everybody revealed what they had been experimenting with and how awesome it was. That was the first year, I think 2014 was the first year they had a convention and they, it just exploded. Go just exploded and then exploded into the mainstream. And now Go is very clearly the mainstream and all the major corporations out there are, port, are porting most of their software to Go. Um, uh, that most of their, you know, like multi-use kind of kind of applications if they have a specific requirement for performance they're going to rust so yesterday we talked about in influx db ported their their flow query language parser to rust uh, there's every indication that they're going to port their entire application to rust uh, we have alacrity which is the fastest terminal on the planet as far as i've ever seen and it is doing rust and now we have uh you know we have this rather significant application Prisma also uh, announcing that its version two will be in Rust. So what we're seeing, and then we have, there's a gaming studio, I can't find the name, I was looking for it all day yesterday. There's a gaming studio that announced that it's not gonna do any C++ anymore, it's gonna be Rust. So what we're seeing is we're seeing, Rust has hit mainstream enough for big companies to take notice. You know, it's gotten stable enough. It hasn't swapped out their asynchronous model like three times, I think they did in the last five years or whatever. And it's like getting stable and you're starting to see people really pick it up. So the creator of Node is now creating Deno in Rust. Um, so there's just a lot of growth in the Rust place, but it's not mature Rust growth. So what's going to happen is like a two year, fast forward a year or two, all of these companies that are porting their V2s to Rust are all going to be able to report. And they're either going to say, oh my God, we failed and crashed and burned. 
<laughs> or they're going to say, oh my God, roast is the best thing that ever happened to us. You know, in addition, we had like Discord throwing Go under the bus, which was stupid because they didn't know what they're talking about. They tested 1.9 instead with garbage collection instead of Rust. And so even Discord has ported their, some of their core systems over to Rust. So if you're not learning Rust, and by the way, I'm an extreme noob in Rust. I mean, I don't know how many languages I have under my belt at this point, but Rust is still a new one for me. So that's another thing you're going to see me coding a lot on stream as a beginner. So I hopefully that has value for people out there because uh, I, I believe watching somebody who's a beginner who actually knows how to code or something like that or knows, knows security from a defensive standpoint is good, to, is good to learn about because then you get to see, well, what are they bringing to the table that, you know, is going to give me context on this thing. So um, super excited about this. There's lots of opportunities to learn for everybody out there. And I'm, I'm personally getting excited because, you know, my my day to day grind for the last seven years has been helping other people learn and keeping up to date on what they should learn. Yeah. So we have a question here. If, if you don't mind, do you think I can utilize uh, pen testing with Red Hat OpenShaft? Probably. I believe cloud computing will be something big in the future, way bigger than now. So I'm considering those two pessimistic and cloud. I think cloud is dying and, and it's a very unpopular opinion, but I tell you what, it's not just my opinion. So I, I think cloud is going to be around for a very long time. And if you want to get the full take on what I believe about cloud, and, and I'm not just trying to be contrarian here. I, there are very, very subtle symptoms. And if the one, if there's one superpower I have, it's picking up on the little things about what's coming. So I created a web pages before there was ever a web. I had WordPerfect and Novell tell me to my face, we don't need the internet. We don't want to be on the internet. I was like, okay. <laughs> that, was, that was crazy, man. I will, ne I will never forget that. So, but I got to tell you, I, I have a sense of, What's happening here, if, if you go to my playlists, under my tech playlists, um, I did I did a playlist about, uh, hey, AWS, meet, uh, here we go, hey, Amazon, cloud, meet Oxide computer. And it's a 43 minute conversation about cloud and, and why I think the pendulum of centralized, decentralized is actually swinging back away from centralized. And that is, you're seeing enterprises still putting big money into cloud, but there is also some very astute, smart people. There's Steve Jobs kind of people who are seeing this, who are embedded inside of that culture. One of them was the CTO of Joint. And the other one is one of the leading Docker persons who was over at Microsoft for a long time, Jess Frazzle and Brian Cantrell. And they have formed a new podcast, which I need to listen to every single one of them. I haven't listened to any of them except for a little bit of the first one. Um, and they have found they have founded a computer a, comp a company called Oxide Computer. Now, look, there's still going to be plenty of work in cloud. I'm not saying they're dead or they're moving around. I'm saying that we're starting to see the big behemoth, the big cycle of centralized, decentralized is now, we already had the Bitcoin stuff, right? And the cyber cryptocurrencies, which were all pushing decentralized. We're having all of these privacy issues, which is another tweet I'm going to show you. These privacy issues have hit mainstream. They're affecting you know, people's decisions about whether they pick a, a Linux phone or an iPhone. You know, we have Apple winning against the government saying, yes, we get to encrypt our shit. Because why? Because the mainstream cares about privacy and security now. And that means they also care about decentralization. ProtonMail is exploding because their people are done with Gmail. So this, this whole pendulum is kind of swinging away, away from centralized cloud computing and it's, and, it, and more towards onsite. And I've watched this process since the seventies, you know, my grandpa was in computing too. And it goes like this, it goes centralized, decentralized, centralized, decentralized. And you know, being in the middle there. So why is this important? Because I, why do you care? I, I think in, I personally went down the Amazon path and I thought, oh, I'm going to go get AWS certified. And I love Amazon. I mean, there's a lot of problems with Amazon as a company, but if you're going to work for a big tech company, that's the one that I would work for. I would work for Amazon in a heartbeat if, if that was what I wanted to do. I mean, if I were going to work for a big tech company, there's way more innovation happening there than Google. Lots more innovation. If you're if you're looking for AI and machine learning, then yeah, Google's probably your place to go. If you want to look for quantum computing, eh, they're all kind of equal. 
Um, if you want to do if you want to do cloud and to be t- to completely honest, it would be Amazon, right? Microsoft, if you want to be Microsoft's kind of cool. They've got a little niche they're carving out there with Azure, um, and now the Linux partnership that they have. So, but my my point is. Um, Smooth me with your words of wisdom, Papa Rob. I'm twisted my guts into anxiety over some trivial stuff today. Oh, I'm so sorry, Acerbic. Um, <laughs> Jedja. Jedrob. Jedrob. <laughs> I don't mind that. So so let me just say this. First of all, I'm really excited with the, the, the prospects of cybersecurity across the board. This is this is a career path that is going is exploding. It's the number one fastest growing tech path period. Uh, and and we're going to see that. Cloud is still a thing. It's not going to go away. Understanding it is important. Setting up clouds for companies on site, like through, you know, with GitLab and Oxide Computing and stuff like that, are going to be a big deal. And so you're going to have the option. And and I personally, I, I don't like the future where everything is in three different cloud providers. The future where the cloud providers are in charge of everything and in control of everything is not a future I want to be a part of. So even though it might be the way things are going and there might be good money in it, it's not where I personally want to invest my time. I would rather invest my time protecting our infrastructure and allowing people to build their own knowledge bases, their own systems, their own clouds. I would rather encourage a more granular, a more organic distribution of of work which is what we're seeing with GitLab and remote locations for works we're seeing i want to break up frankly i want to break up the large things because the large greedy monstrous companies that are walk that are gobbling up our, our earth right now are not the end solution and if we keep letting those things happen with no ability to break them up. I'm not even saying that they're necessarily particular. In some cases they're evil, but most are not. I don't. I just don't like that future. I would rather a future where we are promoting and working towards, you know, a lot of smaller uh, or medium medium sized companies that can move more quickly. They can adapt. They don't get as dogmatic about everything. And you know, like Steam, like Valve. Valve is a really great example of this. So you know, the smaller the and faster the companies, the smaller and faster. Uh, our world can can proceed, and we get in trouble when we get these monstrously huge organizations that develop cancer and now host everything in the universe. What if what if Google went down? What if you couldn't use Google to log in? Our world would stop, and that that's that's not a world I want to live in. So so that's enough of my philosophizing about that. But that's why, yeah. But what's wrong with getting services from big companies since it's ready? Yeah, and you're absolutely right. You can't escape it, right? You can't, you can't escape big services. And I use Amazon all the time. Uh, it's been built by smart people. It has been built by smart people. Uh, but, but it hasn't necessarily been built by people who, who understand, who ask themselves the question, what if everybody did what I'm doing right now? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what I'm talking about. So my, I'm, not, I'm not in favor of that much power in anybody's hands. And, and it, it's a very, you know, politically kind of, inflaming discussion but when you put that much power i'm not talking about taking away the power i'm talking about not building up their power you know i'm like saying look there should be another there should be another option and the the thing okay so ultimately this is what my mantra of life is what if everybody did it that's my religion what if everybody did it if every and i know not everybody can do this because we need to have firefighters not everybody can be a firefighter blah 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 blah. people always take me to task on that but the point i'm trying to make here is that you if everybody google doesn't ask what if everybody documented the entire library of the world and made it only available to certain people what if everybody chose not to release their data about about their to the anthropological scientist community, which is true. Google has refused to release any of its search data to any of the official institutions and official organizations for anthropological studies. And these are really, really important organizations that are that are tracking humanity and what we're doing and the science of humanity. And they are completely blocked from any of this data. Google's like, no. We want our data. We gathered our data. We tricked everybody into giving us their data. And we are going to mine that data and market the shit to them. And we don't care about you, science. We don't care about you. They'll give lip service to it. So what if everybody did what Google was doing? If everybody did it, we would have a world that would be impossible to live in. 
you know, and I, and I don't, I don't, so, you know, what if everybody did what Oxide is doing? They're selling a product that's competitive or what if somebody else was up? So my problem is these big organizations and these big cloud companies in particular are playing by the rules of what can we get away with because they're all about competition and not collaboration. And that some people say that's communist thinking. I don't think so. I think I think there's room enough. This scarcity mentality needs to die. And this idea that if you don't beat your competition, you're going to be nothing. You're going to be irrelevant. Well, I think you don't need to beat your competition. I think if we took more of a collaborative effort, we could actually push progress in humanity faster along and figure out how to how to how to make enough money to get by instead of how to make enough money to be ridiculously insanely over the top wealthy, which is what the the people running is coming. Anyway, I'm way down a rabbit hole. Thank you very much. But um, I don't think it's wrong getting services from a big company. I just think that we have no way to hold those count- those companies accountable. And I'm I'm I, I would rather choose a solution. I'm not saying I wouldn't. I'm, I'm I'm not even judging people who use Amazon. What I'm doing is I'm saying that I personally choose to develop my talents and the companies that are out there that are not dependent on Amazon, right? The Arco technologists <laughs> and Arco technologists. I, I, you know, I think, I think that technology is becoming in many ways the, the power of our world. And I just, it's not being distributed properly. And people are selling out for the wrong reasons. And they're saying, hey, it's not my problem i'm just paying for my kids here and i think we should think about it i do i just do anyway here we go so prisma um so that was the thing what else we got here um how much time we got 12 17 and we have to be done at yeah i only have about 20 minutes left so i'm gonna burn through uh, the rest of these as fast as I can just to give you a sense of the news and just make you aware of them on Twitter if you want to see what I think is important and worth looking at. So um, here is a web security a friend on stream told me about this. You can go do this web security academy for free online. Uh, this covers bug bounty stuff and it was created by the people who made Burp Suite which is a Java based uh, application for searching the web for vulnerabilities and then cashing in on them using bug bounty. Uh, I would love to put Burp Suite out of business and make an open source version of their product essentially in Go. Uh, and I don't mind them saying that guys, you know, I just think that they, they charge like some three, four, five thousand dollars for their products insane. This is this is what happens when you have a company that's doing something nobody else does. So it could easily be written. Hey Vivex. So next we have uh, Golang projects. This is what I'm talking about. So I constantly get Go jobs. So Golang jobs, senior Go developer for X Team, remote work. It's all remote. So a lot of these projects. So go GoLangProjects.com. You can go check that out if you want to look for Go jobs. If you're going down the site, again, I just said that we're going to be doing more about cybersecurity and pen testing on the stream. That's my preferred uh, focus and preferred way to, to help people learn. But if you just want to do straight up go programming all day, every day, there's plenty of opportunity there if you want to do that. See, 20 years of go required. I know I've seen that with React too. Uh, hey, Vivax, we're doing, this is Coffee Talk. You can have a look at the schedule down below in the panel. Uh, so I'm just about ready to conclude it. But appreciate a follow if you want to if you want to talk about things tech and um, cybersecurity kind of things. Okay, so here we go. Um, oh, awesome. Okay, so they just released the HTTP test package in Go, so you can actually test HTTP, uh, which is cool because I love Go. Um, young people, anti capitalist. Oh, this is. Oh yeah, this is fun. So this is so I brought this in here because this is Austin Allred. He's the CEO of of Lambda School. We talked about boot camps. Lambda School is one of the only boot camps that I would consider going to. Uh, Lambda School is a we get paid when you get paid uh, organization that has a lot of really good people working there. Uh, they they have like I think they're one of the ones that has actual you know college professors and people that are working there teaching their data science and stuff like that. In fact, I know because one of our guys Tom might even be on there right now. Uh, I think talked to them about their first round of applications. They are a little bit picky. Uh, getting in there because they they want to make sure you succeed because they don't get paid if you don't. Uh, so just know about that. But this, they are constantly tweeting about how the 
the cost of a school degree is just going insane. And I, I love that they're posting that because, you know, it's like young people are anti-capitalist because we have made it impossible for them to accumulate capital. <laughs> Because so again, you know, the more you can do this with the least amount of money, the better. And cybersecurity is one of those paths. Uh, oh, I just went live. I've been live the whole time. Why are you just sending that out now? We talked a lot last night about sleep paralysis. It was kind of a fun topic. Uh, and we, I had to repost this. So <laughs> this is actually really, he talks about how he gets night terrors and thinks he's being choked to death. And we just got really crazy at night. Um, we talk about anything at night. So if you if you check in after that time has passed, you know, you're going to hear a bunch of craziness. So I think last night, yeah, last night we were playing with, with, uh, with, you know what this is, right? Anybody on stream who has, no, you can't answer if you already answered. Anybody recognize this? What famous movie does this character come from? <laughs> So again, this is a this is a tweet that was left over from last night. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you. I'm gonna have to. Yeah, you got it. The kid and rabbit. Yeah, we were we were being really silly last night. So anyway, so figlets are a thing. So Zeros is the one who taught me the word figlet. I didn't know it existed, and apparently there's an entire figlet application. And you'll see me coding a lot of figlets online because I'm using them for my automated status updates. Um, Fun fact, university loans and child support are the only two types of debt you can't default in the U.S. Absolutely true. I know that because I have both. Actually, my student loans are paid in full. Thank you very much. I worked three fucking jobs to pay them off during school. You want to you want to get a better job, work during school because it'll help you in every way. Mm. Brain F is awesome, isn't it? I had a few. I'm glad I did you. Did you find out about that Vivex from here? If so, I'm going to be very happy. I'm going to take a little credit for that. Brain F is a fantastic language if you want to like really get your head around something that tests you. Yeah, burn Vivex in fire before it spreads. <laughs> why encrypt? Why encrypt DNS in your web browser? Okay, so we were talking about this, people. Uh, so. Um, this is super big news. If you're not following this, make sure you, you follow this. Oh, I'm going to go. I'll pull that up in a bit. So if you're I'm probably over my time almost. Yeah. So Chrome Fire is following Firefox and they have declared that, that they are putting uh, HTTP. It's called DNS over HTTPS. It's an official specification that, that encrypts your DNS queries, which makes it impossible for anybody anywhere to see where you're browsing. So in many ways, that significantly reduces the need for using something like Tor or a VPN. All right. So if you if you want, this is really, really good news for privacy advocates, because this means that your ISP cannot watch what you're browsing. And right now, if you've ever noticed, my wife has been telling me your whole house, it will start to see ads based on your IP address and what sites you go to because they're being tracked. They're being tracked by everybody upstream. That includes your television and, and anything that comes from your IP address. And so you'll start to see ads for your, I, I keep, I continue to see Instagram stuff or Pinterest stuff from, from her interests because it's associated with the IP for the house. And that we'll never be able to get away with because it's, because they've, that unless we change the IP, which is what a VPN is all about, uh, they'll still be able to track browse behavior by IP. But they won't be able to tell what sites you're going to. So they, somebody can't just tap the wire. And, and, and this is really important. Anyone else using the network can see and track websites you visit and may redirect your browser to a malicious website. We had somebody on this on asking a question about this earlier today, and I just want to touch on this. So they were asking, is there any way for them to redirect? And there actually is. If you're if you're in an airport or anywhere that doesn't have a good network, they can actually uh, cover this, and um, that's like really dangerous, right? Because that means they can actually redirect. They don't need to fish you. They can change what site you go to and they can make you go to a site that you think is real and enter your password and then they got you. And phishing attacks are the number one way that people, that corporations and places are getting attacked because the people are always the, 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 the biggest link. So this is a really good thing. Uh, all right, so here we go. We have um, internet reasons to get off smartphones. So malware... Yeah, this is um, 
I don't remember this. Oh yeah, Android malware can steal Google Authenticator two-factor codes. So stay off smartphones if you can. Or use one of the ones. There's a, a new version of Android that's locked down. It has all the Google stuff removed. Mm. Oh, and congratulations to Zeros who got his his uh, uh, essential certification. And he told us that publicly on chat. So I don't have a problem telling him here. Uh, some people are using large-scale NAT. You think they can still track your browsing activities? I don't know. I I think they, they can track you by IP. Um, I don't. They can't look specifically up at the sites that you're looking up, but I don't believe they could track your packets. Yeah, they could track where your packets are headed. So large scale net. Yeah. So I I still think they can track you, but they just don't have as much. They'd have to do a lot more work, right? Tracking that tracking that like that is a lot harder because that's like really hard. <laughs> it's like you know. Because they'd have to know where the IPs or packets are going, then they have to reverse look up where those IPs are, all that. So I, I still think, hey, hey, X twenty two one. So I still think tracking those kind of things is going to be in your best interest to use a VPN. That's really, I don't. Maybe that's a good point. Maybe we should not tell people to to rest assured that you're fine now. We should say no. You still need a VPN because you can be tracked, even though DNS can't be tracked. Hey, Nano Hard. All right. Um. So, okay, here we go. Um, Evan Yu released a documentary. Uh, this is really big news. So Evan Yu released a documentary of how Vue was created, and it's actually really good. He, he goes, I mean, Evan Yu was on the Angular team, and he left Angular at Google to pursue the Vue uh, project, and uh, I am really looking forward to watching that. So maybe give that a look. Uh, what if you encrypted a tunnel to a VPS you control? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, because as long as, because, yeah. I mean, there's still, the packets are still going to travel for their network. I, the only way to get around that is to, yeah. I wonder. No, because the packets are still going to have to travel. You, you, the only way around that's a VPN, period. Because the VPN is still going to like remove you from that first hop. I didn't think Samsung had much control over the software once it gets in the hands of the phone. Yeah, I well that's going to be interesting to see. There is um, uh, there is a new operating system that is replaces Android in the works. I talked about it some time ago. I can't remember it. Um, yeah, I guess you can do a homebrew VPN. I mean, you'd have to make. You'd have to make all your requests directly. The problem, I mean, it, it would have to, no, no, I don't, it would still, no, because you would still, it would still register packet traffic with your local host. I mean, it, NAT does that, I mean, VPN does that anyway. So, I don't know. Uh, let's keep going. So, so, this is a big thing. The market size of cybersecurity industry was $168.7 billion in 2019 and is fat, forecast to grow 9% in 2020. So that's $169 billion. So to give you a sense of how big of an industry that is, so Nike Nike is doing like, was it $4 billion a year? And so, you know, this is a big industry. It's fast growing. It's a great place to get work. Uh, taxation is, is theft and everyone should grow their own VPN on their cabbage patch. <laughs> it's just making me sound like a modern Tolstoy. <laughs> Which I would consider a great compliment, by the way. <laughs> Have you read Resurrection? I love Resurrection. It's like one of the best ones. Or Confessions, actually. Confessions is a better one. They're both good. We need to discuss the iOS and Android in terms of security. And that's uh, that's what I was just talking to you about. So make sure you go read this uh, right here. Android malware can, skill, can steal Google Authenticator to a factor codes. So make sure you read that one. Send the Twitter feed there. Heck you go. Um, all right, so cybersecurity skills gap. So this is actually a really great review that I saw. It shows, uh, this is a really good article from Mr. Kurt John here, cybersecurity chief officer at Siemens USA. Uh, it's a big software services firm. And um, so they talk about uh, nearly two thirds said the organization's cybersecurity teams are understaffed. 
More than half said they have unfulfilled cybersecurity provisions on their team. Nearly two thirds said it takes company six months or longer to fill unfilled positions. Why do you care? I'm showing you this because there is a drought of unfilled cybersecurity positions and there is a huge opportunity for those who get the, can fill those positions. For them to be sitting on open cybersecurity positions that can't be filled for six months is a big team. This is a particular, what I would suggest you do, I, I can't answer that right off the bat, but just it's in the Twitter. If you want to go click on it and follow it, you can decide what, um, what was involved with the research that they did. Okay, whenever I see a research study like this, I take note of it because this is somebody who's putting a lot of effort to tap the minds of, of organizations out there. So this is a really, really good write-up. Uh, it says here, I need the promising direction by embracing a mindset when it comes to viewing more new talent. Um, and uh, I don't know if it's blue team or red. As I've said before, blue team to me is just system administration. Uh, I am imposter syndrome done freaking JS cybersecurity job prospects will probably drive me off the bridge. Uh, there's a lot of work in JavaScript true acerbic, particularly for React developers. And you know my feelings on React, but still you're in a good spot if you're gonna if you're a good React developer. I think there's, there's definitely work there. Uh, as I said in the stream yesterday uh, in the coffee talk, you can watch it. So um, the my take on what's happening with the industry and there's a, there's a few things popping up that are showing this blogs even is that software is in decline right now because the we're in a we're, we're in a kind of a bursting bubble right now for software and we have a lot of boot camp people on the market so i actually think that it's a bad time to be looking for software jobs and you're going to have to be even better than usual because it's a lot like the 2000 when it bubble burst i got out of software development and just let me tell you how this works so you probably know this when nobody has money because the economy is bad and the bubble's bursting they take all that money they were paying for new development and they give it to the people to keep their systems safe and backed up Cybersecurity, systems administration blue team blue team system and sre to me are the same thing because all they are doing is making sure the system is patched and monitored properly and that you know what's coming. So to me, blue team and SRE and sysadmin are, are one. And, and that's what I did at IBM. And then, then the red stuff is like, I don't care how to patch this system. I'm going to break in it. They're like, oh, it's not my problem. Your problem. I used, to, I used to think you needed to learn how to defend before you could attack. I don't agree with that at all anymore. I think I think you should learn to attack and break into things and force people to respond by saying you need to figure out how to patch this or don't code that that way in the first place. That's not my problem. Because in the process, you're going to learn a lot about how to patch the systems. So you're probably working. Don't force people. Right. Don't force them to do anything. But um, but but by but by breaking in and showing them, hey, you have a vulnerability here, you can they can then come back and then they can kind of apply that that knowledge. So I, I have a feeling that this, whenever somebody says cybersecurity, they're generally talking about either InfoSec, which is the business aspect of it, upgrading their confidence in staff uh, who know how to be safe. Whenever you see the word cybersecurity, it's either InfoSec, how do we be safe and how do we make our company do things that aren't stupid, like click on fish phishing campaigns, or they're talking about pen testing, which is attacking, or they're talking about patching and keeping their systems up to date, which is blue team. I mean, that's just, as I said, system administration. So let's keep going. Um, how can I check if an application has a vulnerability? Well, that's a big, big question. <laughs> First of all, you need to scan it. You need to get it fundamental knowledge of how it's working on the middle. You want to run Nmap against it. You want to you might want to get look at a tool like Verb Suite or one of the existing bug bounty tools out there. I don't have any none to come to mind right now because I don't know a lot of them. But then then I would I would go find those things and I would run the scanning against your own site. And it's a good thing to do that too because otherwise you might end up getting hacked. Uh, if it is a website, I would the number one thing I would look for is a cross site scripting uh, attack. Uh, if it does get a ping, uh, I don't know. If you want to, you can follow me or whatever. Um, the, the number one thing I will, I, I'm not, I can't, I can't, I, I could hack, but I'm not interested in hacking you. So, uh, what I would do is I would apply, I would apply, uh, basic, I would, number one thing I would look for is cross-site scripting 
and SQL injection. Those are the by far the most common errors that are out there. And they're also the easiest to fix if you find them. Uh, it depends on the, it depends on the site. You know, I don't know. If you've got a cross-site scripting vulnerability, you probably would have already been hacked by now because everybody in bug bounty land is going for cross-site scripting vulnerabilities first. In fact, some people are saying that the whole bug bounty, you know, occupation is going away because all the cross-site stuff has been found. You know, yeah. <laughs> Want to make ten dollars? Hack me. It depends. It depends on what I. Nobody can say that they can be. Can I scan you? Yes, <laughs> you know. But you can scan yourself, right? Uh, do I know somebody who will scan you and bug bounty you? Um, I I don't know offhand, but I tell you what. Um, my plan is for this channel is to have more and more people who can do bug bounty scanning against you, uh, and and check to see if you have some cross site problems. I want to see the card hack us hack the U.S. government. It's play money app only. Yeah, so you probably you're probably fine. Uh, let's say let me see this right. You're using the poker app, but you don't know if you can trust it. You want to trust? Hey, zeros, that's a great opportunity, man. You know what? Hey, let's let's let's. Can I just can I? I'm gonna pause, pause. Okay. So this is an opportunity. I really hope that this happens in our community on this channel. Okay. What you're doing right now, zeros and Cecile, or how do I say that, Cecile? If you, if you can help him identify a vulnerability in his tool and fix it, you have a resume bullet. You hear me on that? I'm going to say it again. Okay. So if, if somebody comes into our, wanders into our chat stream and they're like, please, someone help me with my site. I want to make sure it's secure or not. And, and we have a trustworthy group of people who can, can go in there and try it. Who's also learning cybersecurity and bug bounty. We can actually scan them help them find a vulnerability and maybe not hold their feet over the fire for it. And abs absolutely for rush, Russian hair, hairy, hairy, hairy. <laughs> and, and then you, what you'll get, that's it. You see what I'm saying? So if we have people that need to be scanned coming in and then we scan them and we have a, we have a, a code of conduct that says, you know, Everybody who's in this chat is somebody that has taken at least the oath. And then I would actually, I'm gonna, I want to even make a, a, a page that says, I have signed this document. I have taken the oath to be white hat. And then people could, could, could go there and you could, you could like try to hack it and try to get in as, as, as fun and as professional education. And if you end up helping the guy, check it out. So if you end up helping somebody on stream to get past their thing, you have just added yourself one fucking solid resume bullet. Okay. See what I'm saying? You have added yourself a resume bullet that says, I helped this person fix this particular thing. Boom. Okay. And you can have your cert and all that jazz, but the more of those bullets that you have that I helped this person fix this problem, I helped this person fix this problem. You have specific metrics in your resume, which you always want. And people will say, oh, you did that? So yeah, I was on, I was on RWX Rob's live stream and, and there's a few people in there. I had problems and I, I helped them close some holes. I mean, and that... Uh, yeah, so I, to me, I think that is like super, super duper cool. And an FBI visit, yeah. <laughs> now, if, if you get an FBI visit for that, it's not going to be a bad thing because it's still, you're doing it with consent. And that don't don't spread that fun, acerbic. <laughs> I know you're having fun with me, but that's like people are afraid of talking about pen testing because they think that it's negative. And I love the bug bounty thing has changed that that thinking entirely. The whole culture is now proactively towards helping people yeah so i i i really really believe in this yeah i exist i assure you <laughs> but it, i mean you know when you when you participate in hacker one they actually make you put your driver's license in there with your 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 face and everything because they want to do that <laughs> i could give a thousand dollars for making this work well there you go guys i mean if you've got somebody who knows we might even have you guys might even get work out of this you know, you might find people in it. So, so no, that's what I'm saying. And and I actually had one other story. So I actually had a dad come in from one of my senior students. He's, he's employed now. He's got his, his job at 18. I'm super proud of him. And, um, and he's doing, he's doing DevOps and system security. And that, he's, he's just I'm so proud. And, um, is the future really AI security fighting against AI? No, not at all. I don't think so. You know, the, the biggest AI is really good, but 
watch any of the documentaries about the AI drivers. How come those AI cars are not working, right? Because they can't account for the one-off little things that are outside the normal realm of reality. Because the entire machine learning paradigm is based on crunching lots and lots and lots of data. And so they find the patterns in that data. And if anything falls outside of that path, they, ha they don't have enough data for those potential things that could happen for AI to ever get smart enough to do that. So AI is going to be really, really, really good at all of the mundane things, the things that can be you know, like driving in a straight line or driving on a highway, but it cannot react to that, to that random guy walking across the street who just died, got run over. But with enough data, yeah. But the problem is, you're going to have to have enough data that 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 accounts for, you know, like every single edge case. So we're talking about a lot of extra data in order for to even make it make gener generic rules. It has to have thousands of points just on the regular stuff. Not to mention all the edge stuff. So I, I don't think it's ever. There's going to be humans involved all along. And if you look, if you look at the recent stuff in the news about the Tesla death, you'll you can share, you can read all about that because that's exactly what happened. It was it was an edge case and she was looking down and she said she was never gonna look away from her thing. So, new law comes to change all roads to another color. Yeah, no, if they, if they that's a possibility. If they, if they turn our roadways into railroads, well, yeah. It doesn't take really great AI to drive a train, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Another viewer, yeah, those are all, AJ Barrett, did you notice those after you set up HexChat? Yeah, they come in and out all the time. I can, I'm going to actually make a list of them. <laughs> they're they're, they're uh, probably just bots. Yeah. Can I get a robot AI girlfriend? They have them. They're sexy. My God. There's a whole documentary on that. <laughs> all right. Um, I think I am about done. I went over a little bit, but that's okay. Um, I think I'm going to go to one today, unusually, because I got started kind of late. Guys, if you can make it so, can see a whole punch card, a whole card on this application in real time. I reward you. Um, yes, there's a bunch of vis visitation bots on Twitch. Yeah, that's what those are. Um, we would love to check it out. Uh, I'm actually kind of wondering if Cecile is actually Guru's Guru Tricks. I'll see what he has to say about that. Hmm. Are you masquerading, Cecilia, as guru tricks? Are you really guru tricks? He's now working for the for the uh, place you were going to work. <laughs> Rubber Slayer is a live streamer when I click on him. A lot of those live streamers are using... I know for a fact that a lot of those live streamers are using uh, bots that do this. And people, I've been on, I can't remember the name of the one, but they'll click on the name and go to the channel and say, who's this person following me? And, it, and then the, the chat there is all saying, hey, well, I saw this person following me. That's how I found out about you. There's a lot of, there's a lot of just chatting people to do that. So, well, thank you. You know, I'm going to be here every day. Um, this is going to go up on YouTube. So, and um, I, th I think we're pretty much done for today. I want to make sure I, there's nothing really big in the news that I missed. Oh, did you serve in the military? So if we have any veterans out there, uh, they apparently there was a study that came out that said that, that perhaps the perfect cybersecurity applicant is likely to be a veteran. And so, and I've seen this and I'm not, it's not for me, but if you are a veteran and you're trying to find work, please click on that link. And I know a lot of veterans out there who are having trouble getting jobs. So um, if any of that describes you at all, please make sure you follow up on that link. Um, why does the Pentagon care about cybersecurity? So this is interesting. It's kind of funny too. Uh, so the CMMC uh, is a cybersecurity maturity model certification for companies providing uh, services to the government. Why do you care? You care about this because this, this is another example of the Pentagon and the government enforcing standards of their people and the companies, not just cybersecurity companies, but of any company, any company providing services to the government is now being required to have better cybersecurity standards. And so that trickles down and the company that you think doesn't have to deal with cybersecurity certifications and things like that, or have cybersecurity jobs or anything is now being pressured by the government to do better, which means that it's pressuring those companies to have more cybersecurity people. 
And that is good news for you because if you're going into cybersecurity, that means that there's going to be more opportunity for that particular career path. It just keeps going up and up and up. All right, so um, the Justice Department, fine, you can encrypt all the things. So there was a big battle between the Justice Department and uh, particularly Apple about their iPhone saying, hey, you can't put encryption on this iPhone. You're, you're, you're facilitating terrorists. They're talking with each other. And, and we've got, you know, what's going on with that? We can't have that. And they lost. <laughs> and big tech's like, okay, yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah, you can, you can worry about that all you want, but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> so... Um, so that was a big deal because that means that we're going to start seeing stronger encryption and that stronger encryption is being driven, of course, by consumer demand. Wait, why do you care? So that means that in the open consumer base out there, we humans actually are starting to care about privacy and encryption more, which means that privacy concerns and privacy advocacy is now hitting mainstream more, which means a lot of things. That means it's going to change the focus of all the companies to maintaining their security and having good security standards, which again, you care about because that means you're, there's going to be more jobs in that space, staying encrypted, staying safe, you know, quality control, all of those things, bug bounties. Those are going to continue to be focuses for you to get a job. Uh, if you're going to write application software and you think you don't have to be involved with security, you got another thing coming because they are going to require it from, they're going to actually require demonstrable evidence that you've done the due diligence, just like our friend in the chat today is doing to make sure you can't be hacked. Yeah. The back door can be exploited by anyone. Right. Right. Uh, let's see. Yep. Let's see here. Uh, Okay, another company that's making a big to-do about security is Cisco. So Cisco is throwing all kinds of money into their Cisco security and they're creating their own certification product and everything. Again, more evidence that this is the fastest growing tech career. Um, looks like cybersecurity jobs in Arlington, Virginia. Would I have to be a military haircut? So uh, this is right up the street for me. Uh, there seems to be a lot of opportunity uh, for those in the military who have come from the military in cybersecurity, uh, particularly if you're Israeli. Um, if, you, if you're Israeli, they have a mandatory military service and they have, I forget the name of it, but they have an organization in the military in Israel where it is the cybersecurity one and people coming out of there are like insta millionaires because they have got to do things that are related to cybersecurity and they have a big demand for that. So uh, Jamstack. So this is really cool. Um, I've had several people thank me for this. So a lot of people don't know what Jamstack is. We had somebody on the stream who shall remain unnamed who was banned from some other streamer uh, here in Science and Technology uh, who actually did not, uh, the guy, the streamer did not know what Jamstack was, thought he was being trolled and banned him. <laughs> Which just still makes me laugh. It's like, <laughs> he like, you must be trolling me. Are you trolling me? <laughs> you know? It's like, why would you ban somebody for asking about Jamstack? You know, why don't you just go Google the thing rather than ban the guy? I just, why? <laughs> just Sorry about the loud noise there. So if you want to understand Jamstack, there's a free webinar. Go register. Go watch it. This is coming from DigitalOcean, by the way. Kubernetes, if you want to get into the whole Kubernetes thing, which is indirect, this is more of a blue team DevOps sort of sysadmin thing, not so much cybersecurity, although you, you do need it. Um, I actually want to deploy a Kubernetes cluster with multiple containers that replace Burp Suite with a container, which I think exists out there already. Somebody was showing me about that, but um, so Kubernetes is the thing. Uh, they have a, a, a free book on full stack developers and Kubernetes on DigitalOcean. Uh, if you are not subscribe to digital oceans mailings you should get so because they have some of the best documentation in the world in fact the um uh look at how many man this got 42 likes right away uh and this is this has got 11 retweets and and i've actually had people comment on this saying that that um that digital ocean has some of the best documentation online and i agree and their model for for documenting things is really spectacular so take a look at that um CentOS and Rancher OS. So we were talking about we were talking about Red Hat versus uh, whatever. So CentOS and Rancher OS being added to the DigitalOcean suite says a lot about those operating systems going mainstream, uh, which is great. Rancher OS is a minimal operating system specifically for uh, Kubernetes and K3S, which is a Rancher's version of Kubernetes, which I have yet to really get into. 
uh, good, good to see a Red Hat alternative. So it's fun to see your CentOS because you don't have to pay for Red Hat. Uh, people don't want Fedora. Fedora's pretty much dead, if you ask me. The idea of Fedora was they were trying to placate. Boy, they talk about scandal. When when they went private with everything, um, that was a big deal. And so then CentOS is like a completely independent version of Red Hat. Uh, CS degrees are often the wrong degree to get. Computer science is not... Let's see. Computer science is the science of computers, not programming. It focuses on making programming languages, not learning to make applications. I have CentOS on a spare junk laptop just for learning Red Hat. Exactly. And I ran Fedora on my laptop at IBM because I maintained mostly Red Hat systems. But if I were to do that same thing today, I would be running CentOS. Right. So if you buy into the idea that your daily system should should be the main system that you normally support because it'll make you better at supporting that system, then then CentOS all the way for Red Hat. I'm all, I'm a big fan of that. I'm now I've since kind of kind of tempered that belief. I don't necessarily think that you should be you should be running your own the operating system that you're the most efficient with, which means if it's Arch, fine. But but. You know, make sure that you remember how to do Red Hat stuff because if you're administering 60% Red Hat machines and you're doing, you know, you're doing yay all day in Pac-Man, you might not remember RPM. So I've been doing so much Deb for the last seven years. My, you know, I wrote Red Hat packages for IBM and now I can barely operate Yum or, <laughs> or RPM for any of my life. Uh, there's a core question about why are people hating on, on object oriented programming because it was a bad idea. Um, uh, there's, there's a link to a, a video you can watch about this uh, from, from a guy, one of the Agile Manifesto signers who says it's impossible to do object oriented programming in Java. You can do class based programming. So if anybody wants to understand where this hatred comes from, this animosity towards object oriented programming, particularly in people who were kind of behind the original idea of OOP, then there it is. You can go read it. So, uh, let's see here. Let's see. I'm going to hard stop at one. So, um, let's see. Please help me remove the gaming centric information from Twitch. Oh yeah. So I wrote a, I wrote a request if anybody wants to click on this and vote, upvote it. Um, because I continue to stream and post my streams and they all have gaming in them. And I wish they would remove that. I wish they would let it, they would use the category. So if you guys could give me an upvote there, I appreciate that. If you could click on that for me. Um, the Fuchsia Project, I hate it. Um, we talked about it yesterday in Coffee Chat. I'm not going to talk about it again. Um, it's based on C++ and it's going to fail. It's mostly going to fail. I have, if, it, if it succeeds, it'll be because Google forces it to succeed despite its absolute shittiness. <laughs> so <laughs> Fuchsia developers out there, I mean, the, the way that they even wrote what languages they allow to be used, just the write-up, just the language of the, of the write-up, is just, it's just seething C++ bigot. I mean, it's like you get people who get into a language and won't ever entertain any other languages, and then they just destroy things because they can't see past the limits of their language, and they see everything in terms of their language. And that's it's just, I've seen other teams like this, and, and this particular team, the Fuchsia team, just seems like it's overrun with that disease. Um, so I'm, I'm not looking for anything interesting coming from Fuchsia. It may actually be the new Android operating system replacement because it's all MIT and doesn't have any GPL on it. But no. <laughs> uh, and yeah, this is me laughing about uh, David does bass or Davy bass, which is really great. All right, so that's that's been the review today. I think I'm gonna wrap it up uh, for today and I'm gonna get this video out so I can publish it. Um, just make sure I haven't got any important notifications in in the meantime. Uh, boy, a lot of people are liking that Kubernetes link. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it seems like that one really was good. Um, people like that Kubernetes book because there's a lot of people trying to learn Kubernetes quickly and, and they can't find it. Um, I love this digital oceans documentation is, is bar none the best in the business. So there you go. Um, so it's another resource for you to go to. Uh, look forward to seeing you at Coffee Talk tomorrow if you want to come by. Um, and uh, I'll try to stick with the 90 minutes as much as possible. And I think we're good to go. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and cut the stream for a bit just so I can manage it properly. See you tomorrow. <laughs>